Today we're going to begin the heart of Mill's argument. And as I said in previous classes, on the question of speech, Mill is pretty much what you might call a First Amendment fundamentalist. That is to say, with one pretty trivial exception, which we'll get to later, with one pretty trivial exception, Mill believes that when it comes to speech, there ought not to be any limitations whatsoever. And that's a very, uh, I guess you would say, it's an extreme statement, no limitations whatsoever. So I want to just, before we, uh, hi, before we plunge into Mill, I want to just enter a few qualifications to the statement I just made, namely Mill, except for one trivial exception, doesn't allow for any exceptions to limits on liberty of speech. The qualifications I'm about to enter are not explicit in Mill. They're my interpretation of him. So I want it to be clear that it's not in the text what I'm about to say. Number one, Mill's, Mill's uh, embrace of this principle of unfettered, unrestricted liberty of speech. You, sir, I'm going to recommend you take off your jacket and relax because it's a little warm in here. And I want you to enjoy the experience. I don't want you to feel as if you're on a subway and it's a hostile environment. It's going to be a relaxing environment. It's going to be the equivalent of studying mill in Tahiti. <laughs> if you can imagine that. I'm not sure whether I would want to study Mill in Tahiti, but we'll just conjure that scenario. So the first qualification I want to enter is Mill's goal in supporting liberty of speech, his goal is to find truth. As we discussed in a previous class, Mill is not one of what you would call, he's not making what you would call a natural rights argument. The natural rights argument simply says something like, it is my God-given right to speak my mind, or we hold these truths to be self-evident that our Creator endowed us with these rights. No. No, he's not interested in that kind of argument. He's making, as I said, a utilitarian argument. That is, he thinks liberty of speech is useful. It's useful because it's the only way we can acquire, it's the only way we can gain truth. If we don't have full free and fearless debate, as Mill puts it in a passage we'll look at later. If we don't have full, free, and fearless debate, he says we can't hope to acquire truth. And as I suggested in previous classes, for Mill, truth is an absolute value. To quote the statement I've mentioned in the past, he says, in the opinion not of bad men, but the best of men, nothing which is contrary to truth is useful. If it's not true, it's not useful. If it is true, it is, in Mill's view, inherently useful. And for Mill, the only way to gain truth 
is through unrestricted, unlimited, unconstrained, unrestrained liberty of speech. Now, all of that we've discussed previously. The point I want to make here, and as I said, these are two points that Mill doesn't really discuss. They are implicit in the text. Implicit means it's implied. He doesn't explicitly say it, but it's implied. Number one, liberty of speech does not mean you have the right to curse someone. It doesn't mean you have the right to, um, to heap insult and uh, insult and abuse on somebody to hurl what we call epithets or to use the simple language, it doesn't give you the right to name call. Now, why doesn't it give you the right to name call? Because if I use a racial or a sexist or a any of those kinds of epithets, you are a B, you are an N, you are a F in this or that. That's just, that's just hitting someone with a club, a verbal club. It has nothing to do with the search for truth. And if it has nothing to do with the search for truth, it doesn't seem to me at any rate that Mill would say that's permissible speech because it's just hurling a blow at somebody using language. It's not the search for truth. So one point we can leave out, or I should say one kind of argument we should leave out as we proceed this evening we are not going to be talking about the right to use the B word, the C word, the N word. That's not really what he's talking about. He's talking about the clash, the collision of ideas, I-D-E-A-S. It's the clash, the collision, the conflict of ideas. If something somebody says contains some idea, then you can't, you can't limit it because you don't like what the person is saying, no. But if it's just a verbal club, then I don't think Mill would support it. The second point I would want to make because our culture has radically changed since Mill's time. Mill does not accept the idea that ideas can harm you. When we grew up, meaning myself, another generation, we used to say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never harm me. Well, obviously, I've already said certain names Mill wouldn't allow, I don't think. But we never had the idea growing up that an idea can harm you. You may not like the idea. You may find the idea extremely offensive. You might find the idea um, insulting, uh, painful, but an idea in and of itself cannot harm so far as Mill is concerned. He doesn't accept the category of what we would nowadays call psychological harm, emotional harm. He does not accept those categories. You cannot use the claim 
that it hurts me, it makes me feel X or makes me feel Y. You can't use that kind of argument as grounds for silencing somebody else. That he does not accept. So, in our current culture, which speaks about things like safe spaces and emotional and psychological harm, Mill would not uh, tolerate, accept those sorts of arguments. Now remember, as we proceed, I do think he would accept the argument of certain categories of insult are just the equivalent of hitting somebody over the head. That's out. Okay, having said that, I normally would take questions, but now I'm just, so to speak, laying out the ground rules. The essence of Mill's argument is captured here. Uh, you want to highlight, but the peculiar evil, and there over here, good, up to here. Who would like to read it? We're going to just go around. I'm sorry. It's inexcusable. I'm it's sorry. outrageous. <laughs> Linda. I, I figure, oh, Linda. Okay. it's unbelievable. A family reunion in Tahiti. It's unbelievable. How could it have, the coincidence. You're both walking on the island of Tahiti and you actually cross paths with each other. It's just the miracle of God. Okay, so uh, we'll let Ethan, who is the star, by the way, for those of you who are unaware, James Green, our cameraman, has the most incredible equipment. I went on YouTube and I was very pleasantly shocked by the high definition camera you have. That is not amateurish material. That was very beautifully done. Which is my way of saying, if you get on camera with James' equipment, it's like, Hollywood, here I come. So it's, so, it's equipment, not James himself. I don't know what it is because I have no idea what it involves, but this was very impressive camera work. So, Ethan, we're going to bring you up here. I wish you hadn't dressed so shabbily. <laughs> yes, I'm glad that you are buttoning your unwashed t shirt. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> and he's going to be our reader today, though what I would like you to do, no, because really it's, did you see it on the, uh, no, I didn't see no it. you have to see it, I was just amazed, I mean there are very ugly people in my class and they look <laughs> just beautiful on this camera, I would like you to sit there, so yeah, so they can see you, Ethan, this is your chance, yeah. yes, this is how Brad Pitt was discovered, <laughs> Okay, so go ahead. But the peculiar evil of silencing the expression of an opinion is that it is robbing the human race, posterity as well as the existing generation, those who dissent from the opinion, still more than those who hold it. Okay. When you deny somebody the right to speak, you are committing multiple, so to speak, multiple crimes. You're robbing the human race. P 
posterity the future as well as the present. Those who dissent from the opinion, those who want to express their dissent, and those who hold their particular opinion, which is to say, when you silence somebody, and this is a crucial point for Mill, when you silence somebody, you're not just harming the dissenter, the person who wants to express his or her dissent. You are harming yourself. You are harming yourself. When you silence somebody else, you're actually doing more harm to yourself than you are to the person who is being silenced. Now, that may seem, that may sound like poetic exaggeration, hyperbole as it's called, but not so, not so. Mill, because as I said, he is the master wordsmith, he chooses his words with utmost care when he says that you are robbing yourself more than you're robbing the dissenter, he means it literally. And I will try to demonstrate uh, in the course of this next couple of classes exactly what he means by that. However, we have to have an attack plan a modus operandi, a method of operation for trying to make sense of Mill. And the way we're going to do it is as follows. I am going to lay out three hypothetical scenarios. And then we're going to use those scenarios to try to make sense of Mill's argument. The three scenarios go like this. It concerns three college professors. Let's name a college hypothetically, since I have a student here from my days when I was a professor, Ms. Linda, who actually remembers me. Um, we'll choose Hunter College, which as it was, it was my favorite teaching experience. Yes, it was, I loved Hunter College. It was a very sad day when they showed me the exit. Um, so, um, there are three professors at Hunter College. One in the history department, one in the anthropology department, one in the biology department. The professor in the history department teaches a class in modern European history. And he wants to devote one class of his course on modern European history. It's an intro survey course, introduction course, survey course. He wants to devote one class of that course to the topic the Nazi Holocaust never happened. It was made up. The biology professor teaches a course, Introduction to Genetics. And she wants to devote one class of her intro genetics course to the topic that non-white people are intellectually inferior to white people. 
The anthropology professor teaches a course in comparative culture. And he wants to devote one class of his course to the topic that in some cultures, women enjoy getting beaten and raped. Those are the three classes, one from the history professor, one from the biology professor, one from the anthropology professor. Now, these are intro courses, introductory courses. As you all know, for those of you who have attended college, introductory courses are very big. There are sometimes 500 students. And the professor lays down the ground rules. I am not taking any questions. It's an introductory course, as is the case with intro courses. It's a mandatory course. Every student has to take it. And the professor says, I'm not fielding any questions. Those are the conditions. And now, I'll give you a couple of moments to contemplate the question, should these professors be allowed to teach those courses? Should these professors be allowed to teach those courses? The Nazi Holocaust never happened. Non-white people are intellectually inferior to white people on the basis of genetics. And in some cultures, women enjoy being beaten and raped. No questions, mandatory attendance, should they be allowed to teach those courses? If you believe, and don't be politically correct, and don't be afraid to express your conviction, if you believe they should be allowed to teach <coughs> those courses, raise your hand. Uh, well, let's say there are protests to, with the administration saying that these courses are, they are lies, they are vicious, they hurt students' feelings, they create a hostile learning atmosphere. Everybody is familiar with these kinds of reservations and complaints, and now the administration has to decide, should they be allowed to teach those courses? Or I should say classes or one class in each of the respective courses. So, does that clarify it? Yep. Good. So, who thinks they should be allowed to teach those courses. Raise your hand. Good. One, raise your hand. Okay, you six people, get up. Go to that part of the room. Take your chairs. If you think they shouldn't be allowed to teach those courses, raise your hand. Is it a public all right, all right. What? Is it a public school? Yes, we're calling it Hunter College, CUNY. Raise your hand. They shouldn't be allowed. One, two, three, four, five. Come over here. Move your chair. No, all together. No, you're fine. You're fine. You just, Cecilia, Elise, and Efrat, just come. Oh, you're in that group. Okay. Uh, okay. I'd like you just to separate from each other because you're going to have to talk. So just move down a little. If it does, it's no problem. Cecilia, you want to just move over here? And then we have one, two, three, four. Where do you lean towards which side? Should or shouldn't? Go there. Where do you lean? 
What? Should with qualification. Should with qual go over there? Okay, maybe, okay. Just come down here, I'll move my stuff. Uh, so you, okay. <coughs> maybe should with qualification, you should go over here, because the qualifications will be important. Ethan, should? Okay, I'll let you be, just for today, I'm gonna let you be the, the reader. Because he'll simplify my... And you? I'm not sure yet. I'd have to really think about it. Okay, join a group. Hear their arguments. If you don't like the arguments, you'll switch to the other group. <laughs> but don't act as a spy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's now 7.30. I'm going to give you 10 minutes. I want each of you to come up with... First of all, each group appoint a secretary because we're trying to smash gender roles, choose either somebody who's male or transgender. Uh, <laughs> I'm doing my best. And now, I would like, once you have a secretary, I think, would be, I know you two are inseparable, I know that's the nature of love, but I think it would be better if you come around here so you'll be a full active participant. She's looking at her husband. She cannot separate. It's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It makes me want to retch. I mean cry. Uh, <laughs> okay. Appoint a recording secretary. Who's it in your group? You are, you are reaffirming gender roles. Okay. And here, who is it? Smash the patriarchy. <laughs> yeah, smash patriarchy. You got it. Okay. I want each of you to come up with the three strongest arguments you can. Why they should be allowed to speak, why they shouldn't be allowed to speak. Go ahead. And you'll have ten minutes. And James Green is going to use this time to hone in on you and watch you debate. Maybe he can listen in. Some cultures, they accepted it because they have no other recourse. So, a professor, I believe the professor has the right to teach the course to satisfy that part of the, of the world that has no recourse. In a way that they should, they will know. Yes, yes, because they're in in the, in, the, in a certain culture. They have no other recourse, so they accept that. So in teaching that course, they will uh, open the mind to, to other people who believe that it is cruelty, where, it's a, where in fact it's a combination of other things. So I think that he has the right to teach the course. Wait, so those who hold that opinion, when they listen to the course, they will be exposed to why it's cruelty or why it's justified? They, they will understand why, why they accept it as justified, why the woman accept it as justifiable. I, I could say we should expose people to different ideas. It's like you should know what else out there. It's not just the common wisdom, the things that we believe in and we know for sure. You sh we should see other different ideas. This is my... Like see what the other side... Yeah, yeah, what, yeah. What, yeah, yeah. what they think, how they think. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't have to believe them or agree with them. I just know what's going on out there. I feel like if people have these beliefs that they hold, and even if they're abhorrent, the, the question is, if they believe them, what is, what, how are they justifying that belief? What is the truth? If you really believe that, prove it to me. 
because to me it may be an abhorrent idea. But, and I think if you can only go through that process to find out whether it is or is not a truth. And as long as you have a constituency of people that truly believe that, that's a real thing in the world with us. So you want to know based on what do you believe that. So you're saying a true discussion, like a, a true discussion with well, people who believe that and people who don't yeah, believe Yeah, because you can either, you, it gives you the opportunity to disabuse somebody okay. or for it to be proven. But of course, there's no debate going on in this class. Okay, it's it's a mandatory course, right. and one lecture is devoted to this. Okay, to, to these very, um, you know, ideas that almost everyone's going to disagree with. But I think there's something to be gained if if you repress them, you don't learn more about them, and you have no real you know, first-hand basis from which to argue against them effectively. And I think that's the most important reason to know them. I mean, you have to know them the way they present themselves. So I think it's, it's, it's very important. One class, it's just one class. It's not a whole course of this. If it was, everybody would be jumping up and running out. So I think you're actually saying something that's very similar, which is it's important to know the um, solidified as what establishes that that set right um, yes. to, to learn uh, in detail the other side's opinion even though we think that most people will be honest right and 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 he says you get better um, equipped to argue against it when you are exposed you to more knowledgeable of the conditions under which these ideas have come about, which I think right, is also which is very what you important. said. Yes, right. So you I, I also believe that the purpose of going to college is to increase your awareness of critical thinking. Right, which is what you said. Right, which is it expands your it expands your your. your so we have two arguments right, so far. What's your name? Of the world. Linda. Linda. So we have two arguments so far. One is. Okay. Uh, it contributes to the expansion of critical thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, contributes to the expansion, of critical, the expansion of critical thinking sure. by um, um, exposure to different to different mm -hmm. ideas, and right. and then we have. Right to, to exposure right. to different ideas and Absolutely. but a real t um, detailed exposure and uh, intelligent, right. and then we have the other argument which is um, acquiring a deep understanding of the basis of those beliefs. If I may rephrase what you guys said, mm -hmm. and in a way that equips you. Uh, to have an intelligent yeah. debate about them in the future, an, an effective, an effective debate, conversation, argument—they're um, kind of tied together. Yeah. I think these two too. Yeah. What else? There's another thing. The, we all know the world is round, but there is a flat Earth society in California. Every year they meet and they talk about the flat Earth society. They're not saying the Earth is flat. But they give they give you an idea of what it was in the in hundreds of years ago. So you will come up you will come out of that lecture with a strong understanding of what it was in those days. So you're expanding, as like, like we said, it expands your idea of the world. Right. You can come out of that class stronger. So the opposite view, even though it is wrong, it allows you to think. Coming back to the same critical thinking. What else? Our, our, our first contributes to your own growth and development mm -hmm. discussion. 
yeah. opposing uh, viewpoints. Right. I would also say experiential. Mm -hmm. It kind of um, it hits you. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not even said opposing, no, contrary yeah. opposing. Yeah. 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 In other words, when you say the opposing, uh, you don't get to see the whole square. Mm. The fact that if the university doesn't uphold standards of some sort, it undermines its own position and can, just from a strictly utilitarian argument, it will lose its student body. So it, it has to show that it's upholding standards or else... Uh, so you're saying it'll diminish itself. Right, it will, it, it will lose credibility and so the university has to act as a kind of mediator in these matters and it has the authority to do so so that it doesn't undermine itself. Otherwise, these are all kind of ethical, political issues. Why can't you allow a flat earth professor no. to Can teach I a science class? Is that all right? Sure. What I was saying was, why can't you allow a flat earth professor, if you can allow a Holocaust denier, racial supremacist, why, why can't the uh, professor who's been you know, had been teaching fairly conventional stuff, and then all of a sudden one year they say, well, now I'm a flat earther. Can the university intervene? I would say yes, because uh, there's a risk to them that they'll lose their credibility. I don't think the universities are banning BDS. It's, uh, okay, we're in the ten minute mark. You've had enough time to discuss it so that even if it's not written down, it can represent your group's ideas. Um, What's that? You'll forgive yeah. me if as we yeah, go yeah, along, true. I will probably uh, take advantage of my position to interject ideas because I want you to get the mill text. As we debate it, it's important to uh, also bring in Mill, because I think he sheds a lot of light and clarity on the question. So I'll ask Ethan to resume his place at the... Uh, I'm going to do this one too. Excuse me? So should I do this as well? Oh, who was here? I already, oh, Efrat, if you don't mind. But both of you can contribute along the way. Okay, good. Okay, because the negatives, the dissenters, have the larger burden to bear because they're arguing effectively against the master, Mr. Mill, we'll let you go first and let's hear your first objection, the one which you feel is most compelling the one which your opinion carries the day. So what is your most compelling argument that you, um, that you um, came up with after deliberation? I don't know that we found our most compelling argument to be all that compelling, but um, I think the top one would be yes, uh, that the, the class or, or rather, no, they should not be able to teach the class without um, allowing some discourse or questions to be asked because um, no there'd be no exchange of ideas. Okay. It's not unusual in my experience that that's always taken to be the most serious objection to the scenarios that I laid out. Namely, it doesn't allow for free exchange of ideas. And in the absence of a free exchange of ideas, because no questions are going to be fielded by the professor, in the absence of this free exchange of ideas, they should not be allowed to speak. And you are nodding your head to that, I notice. I've always found that to be, I'll give you a chance in a moment, but I want to, so to speak, dispose of the easier arguments and get to the harder ones. That objection has always struck me as peculiar because by your reasoning, you shouldn't read books by authors who can't 
hear your objections. Why would you read Mill? He's dead. You can't answer him. You can't pose questions to him. Why would you read Plato? There's a rational person. You're in the car. You're in your car. I assume some of you drive. The economy hasn't yet reached the point where you're all using public transportation like myself. You're in a car. You're listening to the radio. You hear something on the radio with which you very strongly disagree. Some absurd in your mind statement. So I ask you, Elise, do you switch the dial because you can't answer the person? Or does a rational person listen even as he or she can't answer? What do you do? I would listen. If you're reading a book which contains appalling disgusting, misogynist, xenophobic, Islamophobic, sexist, racist, anti-Semitic sentiments. In other words, Donald Trump's <laughs> daily reading matter. Do you continue to read or do you burn the book? You don't burn the book. You don't burn the book. So the fact that you can I have to be careful, I'm not disturbing people. The fact, OK, let me just close the door. I had this when I used to teach. I can't close the door. OK, I'll lower my voice a little. Um, I don't want to be a disturbance. Dove hiking may use it as grounds to have me fired. <laughs> Private joke. <laughs> okay. Um, you raise it in the state assembly. I was loud. Um, those are obviously not rational grounds for suspending discussion, I think. Am I mistaken there, Cecilia? Communication is two-way. Not always. No, it's, then it would be a monologue or so little Yes, bit. and reading a book is a monologue. And you still read the book because there's a dialogue with your brain, even if you can't talk. There's always a dialogue, Cecilia, when I'm watching something I don't agree with or listening to something I don't agree with. I'm always thinking, how would I answer that? How would I answer that? What's the argument against that? There's always a dialogue. The mind is a very active faculty, even as you're not able to speak. You don't have to talk all the time. Sometimes you can listen and think. And that's what you're doing in a lecture class. You are listening and you are thinking. It's not a monologue. It's a dialogue with your mind. What do you say to that? Your name? Anne. Anne. Oh, Anne. Yeah, Anne. Do you know I, I knew you? Yeah, no. I, I know. Yeah, and I, uh, that's my old age. It's, the brain dying. Do you agree with that, Anne? It depends. Again, I'm going to qualify it. If it's Rush Limbaugh speaking, I would turn the radio off. No. Why How not? could you do that? Because I don't want to listen to this rubbish. You can't know, Lynn. Lynn. My name is Anne. 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 Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> That was a very dramatic moment for me. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Anne. 
there is a certain elementary, let's call it Cartesian logic here. You can't know something is rubbish if you haven't heard it yet. You can only know it's rubbish after you've heard it. Until you've heard it. And it includes the accompanying or contextual argument you cannot know it's rubbish. You have to first listen, and then you can make a determination whether or not it's rubbish. But logic tells you, you cannot know it's rubbish if you didn't hear it in the first place. That seems to me pretty straightforward. Cecilia is thinking, she's cogitating, I feel the waves, <laughs> the brain waves, <laughs> the vibes. So without even going to the other assembled group, I will have to, if you don't mind, discard that argument as, so to speak, on the feeble or weak side. <laughs> but you're free to disagree. Everybody's free to be wrong. Go ahead. So, are we supposed to use this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So the other argument uh, was that uh, a university is not a, a public square where anybody can speak at any time, and that there's a, an arrangement and an understanding that the university has certain standards that it upholds. There's a hiring process for professors vetting involved and that a, a professor even one who's hired even dare I say one with tenure doesn't necessarily have um, a, an absolute carte blanche to say whatever they want if there was a somebody in the science department who became a flat earther at some point a what a flat earther uh, somebody in the science department who a oh, flat earther yeah. yes that the university would have uh, the ability to, to intervene to protect its reputation, its financial interests, etc., and that a uh, comparable argument could be made. Do in you this case. think, you know, you're new here, so I don't know, yet know your name. I know Lynn, I know, Lee, I know, I joke, <laughs> joke, <laughs> joke. I was just Lynn. checking to see who is awake <laughs> and who is not with us anymore. Of course, I know Anne, I know Cecilia, and that's it. No. <laughs> so, remind me of your name? Jake. 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 He was here in the first lecture. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> He's not new. Just once. Are you trying to insinuate <laughs> that I'm suffering from incipient <laughs> Alzheimer's? <laughs> of course, I remember Bake. <laughs> And I like to have my cake and eat it, too. Especially if it's a Drake's cream puff. OK. I know that was a fake argument. OK. Jake, I really do not want to believe that a member of this class would want to suspend freedom of speech because of a university's financial interest? Is that the gauge, the standard we're going to use if the university is in jeopardy of losing money? Which is why, and I'll say it on camera to everybody in China, which is why Hunter College, Brooklyn College, and DePaul University got rid of me. Uh, do you think that is a legitimate grounds? Uh, the financial interest part of it was kind of an adjunct to the. <laughs> I was hoping. Integrity. I was hoping. So the idea I know. Is that they have you threw that in. It thought it would sound good, and now you realize, <laughs> bad <laughs> argument. Let's junk it. So let's go to the heart of your argument. Here I will simply make a technical point. We are agreeing for the sake of this discussion. These are three bona fide professors. 
they are competent to teach these classes, and they are prepared, as in any other of their classes, to use the ordinary standards of pedagogy and scholarship to present their argument. And therefore, a priori, in advance, before you hear them, you cannot make the argument that these are not serious classes, because you don't know. They are serious, recognized authorities in their field. At any rate, they have their positions at these universities. And until you hear them, you have no grounds for assuming that what they're saying is unserious. It's not as if they are off the street. They are professors in the department. And you have no grounds for making the assumption, except for the fact that you disagree with them strongly, you have no other grounds for assuming that they are not prepared to make serious intellectual arguments in favor of their respective propositions. So, you're still stuck in the same place. On what grounds do you say they can't speak? Now, you do have an implicit argument. And I know what the argument is. And for the sake of the class, and for the sake of the momentum of the class, we're going to simply dredge up that argument to the surface. The reason you, 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 and you, and you, we're sitting here is very simple and straightforward. The reason is you think either one, two, or all three of those propositions are flat out false. You think they are the equivalent, as Jake put it, of flat earth society proponents. That's what you think. Isn't that correct, Cecilia? No. No. And That's not why you're sitting here. Okay, I'm willing to listen. What do you say? Isn't that the reason you're here? Frankly, halfway through our arguments, I felt like I should have been over there. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, we don't, uh, wait, uh, we don't like people who deserve the, tri to, the ship. That's to, a traitor. To answer the question, probably. If I, if I, if I look at my contextual arguments for, uh, for restricting those hypothetical courses, mm -hmm. probably, yeah, probably I have a, an issue with something being presented to a mass as a fact without an opportunity for a, a dissent. Jake, you use the expression flat earther. Flat earther means somebody who thinks the earth is flat. They belong to the flat earth society, F-E-S. Jake. I want to ask you a question. The question is very simple. You don't want them to speak because you think what they have to say is ridiculous. It's preposterous. It's absurd. It's the equivalent of the flat earth society. In fact, you make the assumption, the presumption, that if they do want to present these topics, they must be crackpots. They can't possibly be qualified in any technical sense and want to put forth these propositions. They have to be crackpots of some sort, correct? That's what you believe. No, I don't think that. I just thought that if we were kind of making this argument, then the maximalist position would be I guess, on the pro-free speech side, would be that they should have the right to teach it even if they are crackpots. So I was trying to take that on the other side and say, does the university, can you intervene at any point? I mean, if they are a crackpot, then you can intervene, but if they're not a crackpot and they have a kind of well-made argument for Holocaust denial, then you can't intervene. I'm, I was trying to go to the maximal position.
Okay, let's just try to, I'm trying to get a handle on your argument. What's your name? Bob. Bob. You are Linda's brother-in-law. Yes. Yes, I see the family resemblance. <laughs> Bob, which of the propositions do you think is crazy? All three. Of them. All three. Okay. You think all three propositions are crazy because Bob is from the 1960s. All we are saying is give peace a chance. All we are saying... Okay. Um, he has the hippie still in him. He's not willing to acknowledge the 60s are over. Still taking the drugs, still tripping. That's Bob. You're not laughing. I guess you're all on drugs. Uh, Bob says they're all crazy and they shouldn't be allowed to speak because they're, they're spouting lies. So I have to ask you a question, Bob. When I look at you with the gray bear beard, the long gray hair, I see Jesus. I see Jesus. But I have to ask you, Bob, are you God? No. No. If you're not God, Bob, <laughs> what? I don't think. You don't think you're God. Okay. If you're not God, Bob, you might be wrong. And if you might be wrong, you acknowledge you're fallible. You're a human being. You're fallible. You might be wrong. And if you might be wrong, the professors might be right. That follows logically, correct? Can't argue with that logic. Yes. And if the professors might be right, then you are denying your fellow students at the university the opportunity to seize on truth. When you silence the professor and you acknowledge your fallibility, then you are acknowledging that you, in the act of silencing these professors, are possibly, not certainly, but possibly denying others to hear the truth. Now, you have in Mill's terms committed a double sin. Sin number one, you are denying yourself the opportunity to hear the possibility of truth. Because you didn't hear their arguments. You silenced them. You didn't give them a chance to speak, so you don't know what their arguments are. You assume they had to be wrong before you even heard them. So you're denying yourself the possibility of knowing truth. But then you've committed even a bigger sin. Because let's say You're utterly convinced by your arguments. You've thought this through. You've read a thousand books. You are convinced. You are certain. You are positive. You have no doubt. Fine, Bob. You're allowed your certitude. You're allowed your conviction. But let us say... Him, 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 her, her, him, him. They're not as certain as you. What gives you the right to deny them the opportunity to exchange falsehood for truth? 
because before you answer that created. question oh. before you answer it let's look at how this mill let's see how mill uh, puts it let's do suppress let's try suppress uh, no you've got me you got supreme we need uh. and uh, and they don't even mention Diana Ross there. No? Let's see. Uh, no. Let's try another word. These are a little tough because it's all. Uh, let's do just oh, infallibility. Infallibility. OK, good. No, that's fine. You're good. You're fast. That's great. Uh, uh, here. It's here. Sorry. Let's see. Yes, let's start with those who desire. For some reason, I don't see it. Oh, here it is. Okay, let's read it down, all the way down. Great. Uh, okay, let's up to infallibility. Up to infallibility. Great. Uh, would you mind reading it for us, Ethan? Those who desire to suppress it. It meaning opinion. Of course deny its truth, but they are not infallible. Of course he, wa he wants to suppress it because he thinks the three lecturers are crackpots. But, says Mill, Bob's not infallible. They have no authority to decide the question for all mankind and exclude every other person from the means of judging. To refuse a hearing to an opinion because they are sure that it is false is to assume that their certainty is the same thing as absolute certainty. Those who desire to suppress an opinion, of course, deny its truth. Bob says, those professors are nuts. But, says Mill, Bob's not infallible. He has no authority to decide the question for everybody else in the class or everybody else in the school and to exclude every other person from the means of judging, namely exclude everybody else from the opportunity to listen and judge for themselves. Bob doesn't have that right. To refuse a hearing to an opinion because you, Bob, are sure it's false, is to assume that your certainty is the same thing as absolute certainty. All silencing of discussion is an assumption of infallibility. But we have a problem because the whole little conversation between myself and Bob began with him saying, I admit I'm not fallible, I'm not infallible. He admits I'm fallible. Well, the moment you admit your fallibility, your whole argument collapses. I'm gonna let you speak back. I'm gonna let just let's hear no because the prose is nice, and you'll remember it. When anybody tries to silence an opinion, remember the phrase, assumption of infallibility. Uh, now just go to four others. Good. It is not... Uh, just a little, a little... Okay. Good. Start from, yeah, great. And, um, and then just go down to, uh, it's gonna, let's go down to infallibility here. Great, thanks so much. You wanna read for us, Ethan? That it is not the feeling sure of a doctrine, be it what it may, which I call an assumption of infallibility. Mill says, when I talk about the assumption of infallibility, I'm not talking about you feeling certain of your belief. You can feel certain for your belief as far as he's concerned. Go ahead. It is the undertaking to decide that question for others. That's the key phrase. Notice Mill, he puts it in italics. He says, the assumption of infallibility is when you say, I'm certain, therefore you can't hear the argument. When you decide for others, what they can hear because you're certain. I'm sure Mr. Ianopoulos is wrong, so the other students at Berkeley can't hear him. 
I'm certain what Charles Murray says is wrong, therefore the other students at Middlebury can't hear him. It's when you decide that because you're certain, others can't hear, that's for, for Mill what it means to speak about this presumption of infallibility. Go ahead. It is the undertaking to decide that question for others without allowing them to hear what can be said on the contrary side. Not letting the rest of your classmates or your university mates hear for themselves and decide for themselves. And I denounce and reprobate this pretension, not the less, if put forth on the side of my most solemn convictions. However positive any one's persuasion may be. However sure you are of your belief. Not only of the falsity, but of the pernicious consequences. Not only of the pernicious consequences, but to adopt expressions which I altogether condemn, the immorality and impiety of an opinion. Even if you're certain that this opinion that you don't like, whether in the case of Bob, it's all three opinions, even if you're certain that they have pernicious consequences, or they are immoral, or they are impious, he goes on, yet if, in pursuance of that private judgment, though backed by the public ju judgment of his country or his contemporaries, he prevents the opinion from being heard in its defense, he assumes infallibility. Okay, we have heard now two passages from Mill, brilliantly elocuted by Ethan, how would you answer, Bob? Because we want a full, free, and fearless debate and discussion. If we're going to convince, it has to be through rational argument and not anyone's exertion of power or moral authority or public opinion. So go ahead. The uh, discussion is artificial because you created an artificial person, me, as being born yesterday, knows nothing but what you assigned to me uh, in your brain. Now, I know from experience, long experience, that a person who says this is not an ordinary person, is not somebody who is going to teach my children something useful in this life. No, this is common, this is common knowledge of foolishness. And if you can't recognize foolishness when you see it, you can't recognize many, many things that are, that are uh, very uh, harmful. Pernicious. And my objections to this, first of all, is that it was a mandatory uh, 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 course. Second, that it was public. Public, the public has the right, I think, to instruct people in a standards of ethics and morals and behavior within certain bounds. I am kind of like a hippie and I'm ready to take on a lot of stuff more maybe than you are. But uh, I do not think the argument that it is that you uh, that you can take these arguments and uh, structure of that. Oh, if you listen to them, you're going to find out that there's some truth in there, or some uh, 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 lots of facts you don't know. I've lived. I'm 83. I've lived. I I I know from these things they're not going to provide anything. Well. There are an entire group there. How would you answer him? Linda, I understand this may wreck 
your Christmas holiday, but fortunately, we are still only in March, and Christmas is a long time away, so we're going to take the chance that your whole relationship with your brother-in-law will be damaged, but also repaired in the time that elapses between now and Christmas. So how would you answer your brother-in-law? Well, um, I mean, well of, of the three uh, um, ideas that, that... No, 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 no. Let's uh, not focus on the ideas now. Uh, Let's focus on Bob's argument. Basically, Bob's argument boils down to one thing. If I may reduce it in a concise, succinct, but not caricatured form. Bob says, I'm 83, I've been around the block, I know nonsense when I hear it, this is nonsense, and no child of mine is going to be forced, because he's upset that it's mandatory, no child of mine is going to be forced to have to sit in the classroom and endure not just nonsense, but in Mill's terms, pernicious, harmful nonsense. Have I correctly summarized your position? Yes. Okay. Linda, how would you answer it? Well, um, I, um, I would... I Remember just, as you speak now, I don't want you to feel <laughs> pressured. But the camera is aimed at you at and, me. and <laughs> one billion Chinese are now okay. listening. <laughs> okay. Not to mention well, a handful of North Koreans <laughs> who have internet. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, th I think that uh, it, it's, it's very worthwhile to, um, it's very important to hear, to hear all of the ideas, a as many ideas as, as one can, can hear. A and because then you can, you can, you can decide by debate or, or, or some sort of dialogue uh, uh, what 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 you want to keep, what makes sense to you, and and discard what what doesn't. Uh, but plus, even if you discard what doesn't make sense to you, you can still learn from it. You you can you can learn and appreciate. I think um, how. Uh, what the opposing opinion was based on, et cetera, et cetera. You know, like the, the basis for, for their belief that I may disagree with, but, you know. What do you say? Your name? Ewart. Ewart. Mm -hmm. How would you answer Bob who says, I am intending to exercise my right of veto by virtue of my age, experience, and moral, my moral compass says these folks are trash and they're not going to be allowed to teach my kids. Uh, first I will tell him that. You can look at him, it's more dramatic. Yes, I, I will tell him that. <laughs> and fortunately <laughs> Albert's between you so it won't come to fisticuffs. It does not matter who old you are, you're never too old to learn. Okay, it's very number one. <laughs> And Number it's one, and it's very important you're never student. too old to learn a piece of wisdom, <laughs> I would say, of the equal to John Stuart Mill. I don't care if you're 200 years old, you still can learn. And if I can just interject, life is filled with surprises. You discover things each day which you realize hey, you know what? I was wrong. As the immortal Muhammad Ali once said, if you think the same thing at age 40 that you thought at 20, you've wasted 20 years. <laughs> the older we get, the more we learn and the more we discover that our certitudes are actually not so certain. In fact, I was a very certain young man, and as I passed 
the threshold of past midnight. I am more and more certain that I don't really know I have any certainty about anything except for the fact that Trump's an imbecile. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> I remain that certitude. Do you think that I'm going to learn something from those three statements? Do you think I have never, has anybody in this room never heard of these ideas before? They've, they're as old as the hills. I knew these things when I was a child. I knew about this because I grew up in New York, in the Bronx. And, and they, these were common. So I'm saying that this is no news. This is no information. These are old, gnarled, rotten old ideas that have been lying in the mud for the last uh, probably uh, 8,000 years. So uh, I don't think that we have to uh, uh, pay them any, any uh, attention as uh, uh, signals of, uh, of, uh, of uh, learning you, you're going to get from them. Afrat? Um, OK, so I feel I was about to accuse you of demagogy, but then I saw that Mill is saying the same stuff. So <laughs> I'm going to take a step back and try to just. Um, so first of all, I'll answer. I'll just. There's some kind of. I'm starting to get offended uh, personally for those imaginary professors because the fact that they're going to teach those classes does not mean that they believe those notions. It doesn't mean that they hold them. If I want to add to the. Uh, uh, intelligent debate about Holocaust denial, I may choose to teach a class about all the arguments for it so that I can really uh, invoke deep thought about what could be used as an opposing uh, argument for We're that. We're going to get to that in a moment, but to use Mill's language, which we will get to in a moment, what Efrat is saying is sometimes you discover truth by playing a devil's advocate. You may not actually believe what you're saying, but you think that it f performs a useful function to play a devil's advocate. So she says, we have to be careful. They may not even believe what they're saying. We don't know that. And I would add, I would uh, embellish her argument by saying, I think what Efrat is saying is, it makes no difference whether they do or don't believe it. The question is whether performing that role is, in Mill's terms, a useful one. Does sometimes playing the devil's advocate, advocate perform a useful function. However, I'm going to just put that off because Mill will have a lot to say about the issue of the devil's advocate. Go ahead. Can I just, uh, so the reason mm. why I thought before it was demagogy is because you were saying, sorry. No problem. Uh, you were saying the, the main argument your group is relying upon is because you think these things are false. And I feel like I can't, I see, I see a problem with this argument that I'm going to say, but I'm still going to say it. Um, the idea is not that I think it's false and therefore it should not be taught. The idea is where does the line cross with harmfulness to the people who are listening? So for example, I'll take it very extreme. If you have a bunch of five-year-olds and you show them under um, cultural diversity, you show them a, cl a video clip about um, uh, killing somebody with st stoning somebody, somebody to death in uh, some country where they do that, and then you show a clip of sacrificing some, I don't know, I don't know if that happens, let's, but children, uh, and then you show uh, right, cutting of clear. women's uh, uh, organs. Right. I was pretty careful. We're talking about adults. It's okay, college. So that's the pro okay, it's so college. That's, right. So that's a problem. And we assume that people have a reasoning faculty intact. Okay, so that's the problem with the argument, but you, 
you see in this country college comes at 18 and yes. they, these people are being f their opinions are being formed and I don't know how much really they have faculties and uh, well so but I would just well, I would say for argument's argument. sake we simply have to accept you're in college you're able to think for yourself that's part of being in college that's why in college you have a lot of latitude about what classes you take and what you choose to do with your life and one of the latitudes is you should be allowed to take whatever courses you want. And people shouldn't be there to censor what you can hear. Albert. Um, I wanted to respond directly to your uh, argument. So I would take a step back. Or maybe we can put Ewart between you two. Um, so let's say, for instance, at your child's school, like you don't want certain arguments to be taught to them because you you feel as in um, in your age your experience and this comes up over and over again since the olden days. So while well, so it's nothing new to you. But the thing is, it's new to your child. And if you don't teach them, if you don't instill awareness of those arguments from the beginning outside of school, maybe on the internet or at a rally, how do you not know your child will be influenced by those bad ideas? Why not, why not present them these arguments and then you yourself or the class or the structure of the class, why can't they, your child learn the counter arguments to those bad ideas and then they can be better prepared than if uh, if they go outside on their own and they're going to learn it anyways. There, there's a chance that they might learn it anyways. Okay. Albert's argument, uh, if I can, I'm not caricaturing it. I'm going to just put it in its strongest form. Okay. The <laughs> fact that you made up your mind in the basis of your experience should not preclude letting your own child make up his or her mind on the basis of their experience. You've been around the block 20 times, so now you're saying your, bro your son or daughter can't even go around the block once because you've already been around 20 times. Shouldn't your child have the right to go around the block, learn for him or herself? You're going to dictate your child's educational trajectory based on your experience? I have to say, no offense intended, because you're roughly of my generation. I honestly can't even conceive my parents saying that. I can't conceive it. I remember when I was in high school, I took German, because I thought German, I, I studied French and I took German. I remember once, because my parents, as some of you know, passed through the Nazi Holocaust, and I remember once, just in passing, my mother made some comment about it. But that was it. The idea that you would dictate to your child what they should learn on the basis that you already know, I just find kind of shocking. I really do. I, I have to tell Can you I that. Respond yes. To that? Mm -hmm. Do you have children? No. Well, I have three children. Mm -hmm. And what I know is. They're going to learn far more outside the front door than they are going to learn from me. However, I do have a job of giving what I consider my basic moral ideas to them. And I only, you only have a, a shot at actually being successful in doing that, and you got, and it's not easy, and it's takes their whole lives from the time they're little, very little, till the time they're out the door. And all three of my kids are Yeah, but gone. Bob, nobody's depriving you of that right. You make it sound like it's zero sum, either or. Nobody's depriving you of your right to, to no. express your opinions the question is whether others should have the right to express their opinions. So let me ask a simple question. It's what you might call 
and epistemological pressure questions about knowledge. What is the only basis for knowing? What's the only basis for knowing whether what you think is true actually is true? There's only one way to know. It's in the nature of being human. Every five-year-old knows the answer to that question. Cecilia goes up to Anne. They're in a park in the city. And Cecilia says that the world is flat. Anne says, that's ridiculous, Cecilia. The world isn't flat. Cecilia indignant, Cecilia angry, she turns to Anne and she says, it's ridiculous, and then what's the next thing she says? What? No, <laughs> no, Cecilia is a God-fearing woman. She wouldn't say you're an idiot, what would she say? Let me show you. Prove me wrong. Show me where I'm wrong. You say what I'm saying is ridiculous. Then prove me wrong. There's only one way a rational human being is capable of learning whether or not what he thinks to be true or what she thinks to be true actually is true and that only way it's the only way so long as we are creature human creatures the only way is the standing invitation to the world to prove us wrong when we can answer all the objections that come our way then we have reasonable grounds for believing that what we think is true actually is true. What's your name? Terry. Terry. But if you don't let somebody speak who wants to challenge your conviction, you can't know whether or not what you believe to be true is true. So Mill writes, just write, uh, contradicting, contradicting. Can you read it for us? I just popped out of my mind. I'm Terry. Terry. Com Complete liberty of contradiction. Oh, I forgot. It's Ethan, and then you'll read it. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ethan. Oh, okay. Complete liberty of contradicting and disproving our opinion is the very condition which justifies us in assuming its truth for purposes of action. And on no other terms can a being with human faculties have any rational assurance of being right. The only way a human being can have any rational assurance that what he or she thinks to be true is true is complete liberty of contradicting and disproving our opinion. There's no other way. You could be around the block 5,000 times. No, but it's true. You can be around the block 5,000 times. But unless you let everybody who disagrees with you, unless you let everybody who disagrees with you challenge you, you have no way of knowing whether what you think to be true is true. Standing invitation. Okay. The beliefs, read it, uh, Ethan. The beliefs which we have most warrant for have no safeguard to rest on but a standing invitation to the whole world to prove them unfounded. That's okay, that's it. The beliefs which we have most, um, let's, here we go. Most warrant for. The beliefs which we have most warrant for have no safeguard to rest on, but a standing invitation to the whole world to prove them unfounded. 
You have some deep convictions, Elise, some deep convictions. The convictions which we have most warrant for, the convictions which you feel strongest about, have no safeguard to rest on, you can only be deeply convinced of something you can only be deeply certain of something if you tell the world, prove me wrong. If I'm wrong, prove me wrong. If you don't give that standing invitation to the world, you just have no basis for your belief. Unless you can tell me Tell the class, show the class, show the one billion people in China who are currently riveted to this class. I'm not sure why you're laughing. There seems to be a sneer there, as if there's some grandeur in my assumption that the one billion people in China. Um, Unless you can tell me, show me how a person with rational faculty can know, other than that. So I'm just going to go around and ask you, all six of you, who was the seventh Ethan? Mill makes a pretty bold, bold-faced um, claim. He says, Ethan, you're a person of rational faculty, you're a human being. He says, there's absolutely no way you can know what you believe to be true unless you tell the whole world, prove me wrong. And if you're silencing that person or persons, you can't know. You just can't know. That's the nature of being human. <laughs> I'll tell you the truth. I'm not afraid to say I have certain convictions I'm very certain of. And I formed them, Bob, over 35 years of study on certain topics. Yes, I have been immersed in the material for 35 years. And you know what? I'm not afraid to say it. Each time I read that there's a challenge to my belief, do you know what? I tremble a little. I sweat a little. I wonder, maybe the person came up with something that I'm unaware of. Maybe I won't be able to answer it. You say you've heard these ideas a thousand times. You said they're old as the hills. That was your expression. But that's not exactly right. Because the ideas may be old, but the presentation, the facts, the nature of the argument, they may be, may be new. You don't know what kind of argument the person is going to make. You don't know what facts that person is going to come up with. Do you know we're still debating what caused the French Revolution? We're still debating what caused World War I. There's no agreement. Zero. Zero. There's no consensus, no agreement. What caused the French Revolution? What caused World War I? Nobody agrees. Constantly people make old arguments, but with new facts. Or rearrange the, the reasoning in the argument. You can't know that if you don't listen first. You can't say old as the hills. Research shows new things every day in every discipline. You can't know that. I can tell you from me, I, I think I've, on certain topics, I think I've read everything that's ever written, in, given the limited range of languages. I've read everything that's written. And I still tremble because I understand the nature of knowledge. It grows. And a new day, a new argument. A new day, a new fact. 
And I can't be certain of my certainty until and unless I give the standing invitation to everybody to prove me wrong. What do you say, Cecilia? Mm -hmm. I say that in the marketplace of ideas, you cannot have just one tongue crier. They you should can't be have just one? The one person selling everything, like um, the professor saying what he says, but without no questions. But Cecilia, <laughs> you must admit, I'm going to have to stop you short there. You must admit that the contrary propositions, the Nazi Holocaust did happen, people are not genetically different in their intellectual capacity, women do not like to be raped and beaten. You must admit, Cecilia, you hear that every day, all day, for an entire life. There are, in any university, a dozen courses on the Nazi Holocaust. There are a dozen women's studies programs decrying rape and abuse of women. There are a dozen courses insisting on the genetic equality of humanity. So if we're talking about one class of one course and you're calling it a monopoly in the yeah. marketplace yep. of ideas? Yep. I don't yes. see that's what cannot, I don't see what no. for university life. It cannot, that doesn't sound like a university life in my experience. You make it sound like Kim Il Sung University. No. Nope. No, this is not North Korea. No. Nope. No. Nope. It cannot be de facto. If you're a professor, like you have one this class, professor no, in a if, whole you, university, if you are a professor, one class in one course, you cannot say, okay, in your mission for this class, you said interactive, interactive. It would not be a lecture, just you alone, interactive. Why can't the, the university allow that? I would not take a class from a professor who said no questions allowed. No, no, you simply were, not. Why not? Do you because it has have to be to an important thing. <laughs> no, she, that's very sophomoric. She, she no, goes, no, she, no, she no, 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 no. She's like no, the uh, cell no, phone generation. No, no. The Facebook. No, you she cannot be. You, you cannot be. Uni you cannot be unilateral. No. no. Forty-five minutes. No. You have to shut well, up. Five it's minutes. No. 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 Yeah. No. Could you imagine having her in the class? There are five hundred students, and Cecilia. <laughs> everything the professor says. I want to talk. No, Cecilia. Shut up. No, and no, listen. no, 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 no. From One second. Me. No. Next. No. And. I can't follow that. Act. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can't. Carrie. Yeah, I. Um, no, I. I. I understand. Uh, it's the importance of listening to the professor with this one idea but I would have a problem in not being able to like Cecilia but I know if you're in a lecture course of 500 the professor takes the stage and he says what he wants and he walks out or she I, or <laughs> she and I and I would not be comfortable with that uh, with that setup at all I, I want to tell you something I don't, uh, you know, sometimes I joke and sometimes I'm deadly serious and often yeah. it's both at the same time I have only one recollection in college. I only remember one professor. One. His name was Morris Watnick. Reactionary, conservative, nasty, mm. nasty. Very smart, very smart guy. I remember him, he would sit at the uh, desk like you with his hand like this, didn't use notes, just lectured, and he didn't take questions, you know? It was by far, by a wide margin, I mean, we're talking about now more than 40 years ago. I'm 63, I had him when I was 18. I remember everything in his class, you know why? Because every time he gave a class, I took a class with him on China when I was a Maoist, a class on Marx 
when um, I was a Marxist. He was anti-Mao, anti-Marx. Every time he gave a class, I would run, make a beeline for the student center. Mm -hmm. That's where the radicals, the leftists gathered around the table. And I would ask the resident gurus, because I was only a freshman or a sophomore, Watnick said this, how do you answer it? Watnick said that, how do you answer it? What's the answer? How do you answer it? I still remember every word he said. You make it sound like a student's mind is a vacuum. And it just sits there waiting to be filled. And even if you can't speak, somehow your thinking process ceases. That's not how students function. You can just listen for 45 minutes or 50 minutes. Take it all in, cogitate, ruminate, go out, debate, discuss. It doesn't stifle the thinking process to listen for 50 minutes. It was actually, for me, the most exhilarating class I took in college. It's the only thing I remember. Everybody else was politically correct. It was the 60s, all the professors were radical, denouncing US imperialism, denouncing the war in Vietnam, pro-civil rights, supports the Black Panthers. You know, that was what universities were like back in the early 70s, you know? Now I'll tell you something, you ready for this? I don't remember anything in any of those classes, nothing. I mean, it. zero, absolute, total, zero, nothing. The only one I remember was the guy who disagreed with me and the one who made me listen. I, I don't see, I don't, I don't find any correspondence between your description of what happens when you listen and what I take to be the learning process. And the learning process does not cease when you listen, the mind can still be active. The mind can still be questioning. You make it sound as if the mind is just a receptacle. It's not just a receptacle. I'm watching your face now. I'm talking, you're not talking. Has your mind ceased? Have the gears ceased? to turn, I look at your eyes, I look at your face, she's thinking, she's thinking, she's thinking. And I'm disagreeing with a lot of what you say. So the argument that you can't talk, I find completely irrelevant. The question is, does it stimulate you to think? And as Efrat said a moment ago, but we'll get to it in next class, Often what the devil's advocate or somebody playing the devil's advocate, because they're different, sometimes it is the devil's advocate, but sometimes it's a person playing the devil's ad advocate, but either way, that person performs a useful function. They often enable you to grasp truth. That's why we often like a person and again, I'll have to say, I'm getting to it later, but I'll, I'll anticipate. Now, we often like somebody in our crowd who always disagrees with us because that person is not just agreeing, agreeing, agreeing. That person challenges and it forces you. I have a friend who disagrees with everything I say. I want to strangle him sometimes. But I recognize he's a good reality check for me. Sometimes I need a reality check. Somebody who says, but you know, Norman, but you know, Norman, that's a useful function. It may be a pain in the butt, mm -hmm. but it is, I think, a useful function. Mm 